Euphoria the Saga 2 is twee. It's a fact that supersedes any conversation about its genre, or its gameplay, or its progression. All of those things are just vehicles to deliver a vibe. And thankfully that vibe is immaculately curated with a beautiful craft and felt aesthetic. This is a dumb little world inhabited by dumb little creatures with dumb little problems, like Mr. Jennifer and his unwillingness to join you unless you get him Pepto-Bismol to alleviate his stomach issues. It effortlessly weaves non-urgent slice-of-life scenarios into a short but sweet Metroidvania format. It's mechanically light and beatable within an afternoon, but if you're willing to embrace what Euphoria has on offer, that afternoon will be damn cozy. When I came across Euphoria the Saga 2, I knew I wanted to play it, but seeing it also prompted a more pressing question. What is Euphoria the Saga 1? A quick Google search revealed it was a 1991 NES game that never made its date side. I went back to play it for what I intended to just be a few minutes to capture footage, and ended up playing for like an hour because it was surprisingly good. It was a 2D Metroidvania, or I guess just Metroid at this point, Vania was still a few years away from doing the stuff that created that label. There were a few things that made it unique. For an NES game, it's quite easy. If you go in the wrong direction or find yourself in an area you don't have the right power-ups for yet, handy arrows will pop up on screen and tell you that. Unlike Metroid, those power-ups aren't localized to your character, but instead, assigned to your friends. Instead of getting the morph ball, you'll get a buddy who can swim and walk on ice, and you can switch between them via menu. These mechanisms coalesce into a game that's approachable with a comfy and friendly tone, and those elements are exacerbated by some excellent sprite work. Look at how bouncy this jump animation is. Look at this ridiculous crawling animation. I went from never knowing this franchise existed, to being glad it's back after one session. And I was happy to see that so much of what made that experience unique was present in Euphoria 2. You start as a singular character, Hebe, waking up in his treetop bedroom slash bathroom that's also the central hub that all the other zones sprawl out from. Not too sprawling, mind you. Part of Euphoria's short duration is owed to the fact that those zones are only ever a hop and a skip away from home base and easily fast traveled back to when needed. It's pretty frictionless by design. Though you do have an alien with nefarious plans you have to take down, most of the game is really just doing favors for your three buddies and exploring to find secrets. The map borrows some rogue elements in its design. The world itself is consistent, Popoisho Caves is always to the east, and Euphoria Fields is always to the west, but once you go into one of those zones, it becomes its own mini instance platformer level with semi-randomized layout and completion bonuses for finishing. You'll want to get to the end and fight the boss while collecting as much currency and collectibles as you can on the way. Then you're usually met with the option of proceeding to an adjacent level, or porting back to home base and spending what you've accumulated. There's two semi-discrete phases of the game. Your first hour or two will be gathering the crew, which is a sequence of finding them out in the world, beating them in a boss fight due to some sitcom level misunderstanding, then completing some sort of collection task for them. The second half of the game is using all the accumulated abilities of the crew to get to previously inaccessible zones and collecting the prerequisites for a final boss push. Regardless of which step of the journey you're on, you'll frequently want to take trips back to the vending machine at home, which has a variety of health upgrades, utility spells, and other ways to enhance your exploration. Its randomized take on level layouts add a different texture to those Metroidvania come back here when you get the double jump moments. It's not a specific obstacle getting in your way every time because it's random. It's usually a genre of obstacle. Getting the climb with Hebe lets you get to the high levels. Getting the swim from Mr. Jennifer lets you descend into the water. But outside of the non-randomized hub, it's not like there are exact coordinates you need to remember. Just know that the swim helps you with water and make a mental note of which zones have water rather than recall particular puddles within that zone. It's less gratifying than your average aha moment that comes with this kind of game, but it works within the context of Euphoria's effortless difficulty. The combat and general movement style is simple by design, harkening back to its retro origins and also aligning to Euphoria's felt style. Everything is just a little frumpy. Even the simple act of killing an enemy demands getting above them to butt stomp. And if you want them to sit still to enable that cleanly, you'll need to press a button to take out one of your propoons from your pocket, then another to throw it at a fixed angle at your foe. It's not smooth, it's not physically satisfying, and yet, it all kind of works. I can't imagine your basic mode of attack being a simple strike with modern flair and tight control, because that's not what Euphoria is or what it's going for. If that sounds like Cope, just remember that it was like this 30 years ago too. The first game was tone first, and this one is as well, and it's that tone success that makes Euphoria worth playing. The tweeness is overflowing from the screen. 
It invites comparisons to the few times where Nintendo's cutesier mascots found themselves in craft-like environments, but the production here gives it a different feel. Look close enough at any of your characters and you can faintly see the individual strands of felt that construct their bodies and clothing. Whereas something like Yoshi's Woolly World feels like it was made from fabrics that came together within its universe, Euphoria feels like it was made with fabrics that came together from our universe. Seemingly small distinction, but it gives the game a vibe closer to the best British cultural exports that put physical toys and models into fantastical environments for kids, like Thomas the Tank Engine and Brum. It's a wonderful style whose only problem is that I wish it was pushed further. The random generation that the levels lean on limit Euphoria's ability to produce meaningful set pieces and memorable singular objects in this style, as opposed to just tile sets and backgrounds. The vibe is communicated beyond just the aesthetic, though. That old menu switching between characters is now a little high five animation where they tag each other in. Everyone gets their own goofy walk cycle and their own chirpy little Animal Crossing voice. You'll be hearing them a lot because friendly debriefs are a frequent occurrence. New upgrade purchases from the vending machine come complimentary with little vignettes of your characters trying to figure them out. Getting to a new zone often starts with everyone talking about what they think is ahead or verbalizing the indigestion those thoughts are giving them. I'm largely willing to come to the defense of the fact that Euphoria's actual gameplay can sometimes be intentionally simple, but there's two areas where I found that the game's structure was inhibiting the tone and not helping it. The first is in Euphoria's prepare for the final boss collection phase that has you going to new zones and completing them within whatever parameter that level defines, such as not getting damaged, doing it under a time limit, etc. It's the only notable difficulty spike within Euphoria, and the spike isn't the problem as much as the framework around it is. There's no way to quick retry when you fail, demanding that you go back home and trek all the way back to the zone to repeat its challenge. It's annoying in a way that the game otherwise never is. The second is that its random generation and collection focus fits horizontal levels far better than vertical, which is largely fine because vertical sections are the minority, but you can frequently miss a collectible you didn't know was coming, it's random remember, and lack an effective way to get back up to it, usually requiring a full retry. Heeb eventually learns to climb, but certain level layouts prohibit climbing due to ledges or other protruding objects. Euphoria is a beautiful little game. It's lean on randomly generated worlds to prevent the art style from producing memorable set pieces and occasionally cause some pathfinding snags. It's a game that's at its best despite and not because of its gameplay, but it effectively recreates the tone of its 33-year-old predecessor and infuses that recreation with its own style. Its blend of cartoonish characters with real fabrics and craft materials give the game a twee feel, and it sustains that tweeness with its low-stakes platforming and friendly themes. It's only got a few hours of game, but that's a slice of life worth giving. <laughs>